All right, so here we are tonight in lesson number seven, Miracles, Signs, and Wonders, we're going to be talking about tonight. Miracles, Signs, and Wonders. And uh, there's a lot we could say about this, but the key verse, actually two verses, is Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8. Jesus spoke to his disciples, and uh, he told them to go and preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he also said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now notice, none of this is an option. He doesn't say to pray for the sick, to pray for the dead, or, you know, to pray for the demonized. He says to cast out. Ekbalo means kick out. Kick out the demons. And uh, then, you know, he talks about literally healing and, and so forth. So it's, it's an actual command. And he said, freely you've received. And he's not talking there necessarily about, um, you know, I didn't charge you anything. He's re that's not what he's saying. He's saying, liber you've received liberally, freely, without any type of um, reservation or restriction. I've given you freely. So that's what he's, he's meaning. So that's our key verses tonight, and one of the things that we, we've been looking at, the fact is that the gospel of the kingdom is not just a message to be shared by proclamation, but it's a kingdom that's to be established by the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. And um, this is a powerful verse. Don't forget it. Luke chapter 8, verse 1. It came to pass afterward that Jesus went throughout every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And that, of course, is the New King James Version. It says he went about preaching and bringing. So he didn't just preach, but he delivered. He carried the kingdom to the people. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Now listen, why did Paul say... Because Paul could wax eloquently. Paul was a, he was a, he understood uh, Greek philosophy. He was a trained rabbi. He could, he could speak well. He could, he could, you know, just, just literally um, share a lot of knowledge uh, in, through philosophy. But Paul says, I don't do this. My message is simple. Later on, he says, I'm on the mature. There's a message of wisdom in that same chapter. But he's saying, when I go and I preach the gospel, he said, the bottom line in all of this is I'm not trying to get people to look at me and say, wow, look at how wise he is. Look at how knowledgeable he is. Look at it says, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And uh, that's very important that we understand that. That's the purpose of the anointing. You know, to preach without the anointing is idolatry. <clears throat> to preach without the anointing is idolatry. It lends itself to idolatry. Because what happens is, if... People receive anything, they get encouraged, they get, you know, uh, informed or whatever. What it is, is it's what you were able to give to them. Okay, but it says very clearly here that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There's another verse in 1 Peter that is very, very similar. Let me read it to you very quickly. It's in chapter 4, 1 Peter. And I believe it's verse number 11. 1 Peter 4, verse 11 says this. It says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. Not with your own ability. It's not our natural talents. It says, why? That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So if we do it with our own abilities, okay, who's glorified? Who receives the recognition, the honor? Okay. But when we minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, do you ever notice that the focus isn't on the speaker or the the person, it's on, it's on the message, it's on the power that was released, that just, it just kind of supersedes that, and, and literally, um, it's like God just comes in and he superimposes himself, his kingdom, even on what is being shared. I mean, sure, it's, we, he needs people to speak through, but the bottom line is people go, you know what, really felt that was God, mm -hmm. you know, it was God here, yeah, you know, obviously, um, people can stand in awe of, of how, someone use, how someone is used by God and, and you know, you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward and we need to honor those people. But the bottom line is a prophet you know, or a, a messenger, whoever he or she may be, is just that, 
messengers. So, you know, he talks about in Corinthians about we have these treasures and earthen vessels that the glory, you know, the, the surpassing glory may be of God. So it's not of us, it's, a, it's for God and it's of God. So the gospel, let me, let me make this statement. The gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, is not been fully preached unless it's been accompanied by tangible accompanying power. The tangible accompanying power of God that is manifested or demonstrated signs and wonders and miracles. I want to say that again. The gospel has not been fully proclaimed, um, fully manifested, unless it has been accompanied by the tangible power of God, the Holy Spirit, signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, here's, here's the verse. Look at this. Romans 15, 18 through, and 19. Paul says this, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I've said and done. Now, we've been talking about the show and tell gospel. You know, go and tell John the things which you both have seen and heard. Okay, so there's this sense that he says here, not just said, but done. Okay? And, and what is he talking about? Is he talking about the fact that he fed the poor or, you know, not really. He, Paul was involved in that at times. We know that. But that's really not what he's emphasizing here. The things which I've said and done by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit. That's what he's talking about. And then he continues, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Jesus. You know, we talk about the full gospel. And the full gospel is, it's not just, you know, teaching, it's not just preaching, it's not just a, a message, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit dem being demonstrated. Signs and wonders, miracles, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want to do in this session is just share with you just a few reasons, um, there are many reasons, but just a few reasons why we should believe that God wants us to see miracles, signs and wonders and healing today, okay? And once you believe that God wants you and you understand it and you begin to anticipate it and expect it, that's gonna change a lot of things. You know, it's like every time I go somewhere and I encounter somebody and you can get to the place where it's on a daily basis where you go every time I go somewhere and you know I expect that every day something miraculous is going to happen every day God's going to use me to see some type of miracle happen you know I'm going to I'm going to share the gospel with somebody God's going to give me a prophetic word for someone um, you know that's going to just really touch them or I'm going to pray for someone they're going to be healed whatever it may be and it's going to open their heart's door to receive the message so we, we have to begin to anticipate that God wants to do these things. The first thing is that the gospel of the kingdom comes not just in word but in power because of the character of Christ. The character of Christ. And what I mean by that, the character of Christ, is that every miracle and healing that Jesus performed was, was motivated by his great mercy. Throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read repeatedly, there's at least 14 references to Jesus being moved with compassion or having compassion on people. And every time the scripture says that Jesus was moved with compassion or, or Jesus had compassion, he showed compassion to someone, every time in, there's a subsequent supernatural miracle that was wrought. Do you know that? He was moved with compassion, so he healed. He was moved with compassion, so he fed the multitudes and so on. And, and let's just look at one, a few examples here, a very simple example, Matthew 14, verse 14. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And what did he do? He healed the sack. It, it doesn't just say that he was, had compassion, you know. It, this, I love it because it says he was moved with compassion. And so literally it means the compassion moved him. And uh, it, it literally, com it literally um, compelled him to do something. And, and what did he do? He healed the sick. A friend of ours, some of you may know Matt Sorger, and Matt, uh, I remember when, not too long ago, I, he was up in a friend of mine's church in Lakeland, and we went, we went out and we had lunch together. And, and we were, I was, he was sharing a story about just before Oral Roberts died, he actually was able to spend some time with him. 
And you know, for those of you who are not aware of how powerfully Oral Roberts was used, particularly in the late 40s and 50s and even in the 60s, I mean, God was using him uh, in a very, very powerful way to heal the sick in particular. And he asked Oral, who was in his 90s at the time, he said, so I want to ask you a question. What was it that brought you to that place where God was able to use you so powerfully, so forcefully to, to see the sick healed? And, and he, he thought, you know, Oral was going to say, well, it's because I just confessed the word. You know, I had, I just, I read the word and I stood on, stood on faith. And, and he said that Oral actually looked at him and said, you know what it was? Is he said, every time before I would get out there and minister to the sick, he said, I locked myself in the room. And he said, and, and I did this on a daily basis, but I would especially do it before I was about to get out and minister in a more protracted uh, lengthy fashion and he said and I would ask God to break me and give me his heart and his love for the people give me his compassion for the sick so that when I would see the sick I would see them the way that you see them Lord the way you see them father and I would be I would have that compassion and he said now if I when that happens he said that's when I really began to see God do miracles so he was moved with compassion toward them Another occasion, Mark chapter 1, verse 39 through 41. Jesus is traveling throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues, driving out demons. I love that, isn't it? Just another day in the life of Jesus, right? <laughs> preaching out, driving out demons, you know. Another demon bites the dust, right? So, and a man with leprosy comes to him and falls down on his knees and begs him. says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus, filled with compassion, reaches out his hand and touches the man. He says, I am willing, be clean. And of course, you know, not only did Jesus heal this man, but in order to heal him, he violated the uh, Levitical code of not touching a leper. And Jesus was classified as a Nazarene, you know, and you're not supposed to touch lepers of, you know, ever or dead bodies. He touched his dead bodies. We'll see this in a minute too, which he wasn't supposed to do. So Jesus really, you know, doesn't have uh, much of an issue with getting religious people all riled up. I mean, he's pretty good at doing that. Uh, so on the next occasion, Jesus is approaching the town gate in a city called Nain. And there's a funeral procession taking place. A dead person's being carried out. And he happens to be the only son of his mother. And to boot, she's a widow. So things are really bad for her. You know, there's, there's no social assistance. There's no welfare. There's no no way that she's going to be able to support herself. And, and what happens is this large crowd from town that is with her, and when the Lord sees her, the Bible says his heart went out to her. And he says, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin. There he goes. And then what happens? Those carrying it stood still, probably because they're like, Jesus, you aren't supposed to do this, all right? And then what happens is he says, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Here's the point that I want to emphasize. Jesus was moved with compassion again here, and he has compassion on this woman, but here's, here's what I believe. This woman, as a widow, had lost her only son. Now, there's no one left to help support her and take care of her. She's probably up in age. And what happens is Jesus, I believe, now listen to me, is literally says, you know what? That was the devil. The devil took him out. It's not yet time, and he's needed here. His mama needs him. And Jesus said, I'm going to mess up what the, de the devil's plan here. And he literally raises him back to life again. And it specifically says he gave him back to his mother. It doesn't say he said, come and be part of my, you know, apostolic band, follow me. He says, no. He said he gives him back to his mother. And so I want you to understand that, that God is, is just such a compassionate God. You know, there was a time when, when I was praying and crying out to the Lord and saying, oh God, you know, please heal the sick. You know, do this, do that. And, and it was like the Lord spoke to me one night and he said to me, I want them healed more than you do. And of course, we think, well, that's a no-brainer, yeah. But I was like, wow. It was almost like I was saying with God, God, I know you're really not that compassionate. Uh, and I have to beg and plead with you to do this. And I was like, wow, I was thinking way off. My thinking was way off. And, and God just began to remind me. He said, no, 
I want them healed more than you want to see them healed. So how much more? So I, I began to, you know, change the way I prayed at that point and just began to pray that, you know, hey, Lord, I thank you and I praise you. And Lord, if there's any unbelief in me, if I'm not in a place, if there's anything that's blocking me from being used by you, then deal with me because I want to be a vessel through whom you can flow to heal these people because I know it's your will. You're so compassionate, so loving. You hate sickness. You hate disease. It's an enemy. It's, you took, it, you know, you, you dealt with it on the cross and so on. So we're talking about the heart of the king. Now, in session four, we mentioned that the benevolent character of King Jesus is displayed, one of the ways is displayed in his commitment to establish his righteous kingdom rule through his people to eradicate injustice and eliminate oppression. Of course, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19, which is Jesus, um, you know, when it's basically his mission statement when he started off his ministry. He, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover a sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor, again, was the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, what happened? Okay. Yeah, the, the, the slaves were released and all debts were wiped out. And that's how they kept people, you know, kept the economy strong back in those days. So, uh, and it still works today, but anyway, that's another subject. But we'll, we'll just recognize, so he's talking about people's, you know, being, their, their debts being wiped out. Not just physical debts, material debts, but spiritual debts and slaves going free. Now, he's quoting Isaiah 61. Now, if you read Isaiah 61, you'll see there that Jesus is not quoting the entire passage because there's a part in that passage which says, and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus doesn't quote that. He doesn't read that. Why is that? Is it because, you know, he was, you know, reading from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it, it omits it? No, it has nothing to do with that for those of you who who study that kind of stuff. It's actually because Jesus was saying, my first coming, I came into the world not to condemn the world. Remember he said that? In John chapter 3, verse 17, he said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Now, when he comes again the second time, that's when he comes with fire. That's when he comes with judgment. So now it's to release people. So we are under a time of grace. It doesn't matter how bad things get in our world, okay, I mean, and I'm not saying that God doesn't judge nations. He obviously does. And there is a point where God says, okay, you know what? If you're going to continue to disregard my ways, then this stuff's going to happen. But let me tell you, let me tell you something. That the bottom line in it all is it's a nation chooses to turn away from God. It, you know, by and large, corporately speaking, the, the vast majority then we bring upon ourselves these things because we basically no longer have, our, if we're not keeping covenant, then we no longer have the promise that God will protect us and watch over us. So it's not so much that it's God coming and just saying, well, I'm going to do this to you because it's like, we're like, okay, God, we don't need you. We don't need your protection. And the devil is able to come and just wreak havoc in our lives. And um, it's, that's kind of simplistic. I know it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's something we need to understand. In other words, God's a good God and the devil's a bad devil, right? Every good and perfect gift comes from above, right? From the Father of lights. So we have to recognize that. So he's a good God. But healing and miracles are actually the means by which God demonstrates his profound love and his personal concern for his people. His profound love and his personal concern for his people. Now, in Mark chapter 3, there's a story about this man who has a withered hand and it's, this is happening in the synagogue. And, of course, the religious people are watching Jesus closely to see whether or not he's going to heal on the Sabbath. They don't, they're not, this is crazy because they, care, they don't care. They don't give a rip about this guy personally. All, the, all he's going through is suffering. And, and, they don't, and they're not even denying that Jesus can do this. I mean, it's not like, wow, we just don't believe he can do this. They know he can do it. And yet... They, they believe he can do miracles, but they won't believe in him. And so what ends up happening is, you know, they're like, okay, Jesus is going to heal this guy. We've seen him do this so many times, you know. 
And, uh, oh, yeah, he's going to do it on the Sabbath, so let's, let's just, you know, jump on him. Let's, la let's lunge on him and, and just, uh, you know, tackle him into the ground and beat him up if he violates the Sabbath. And so what happens is Jesus calls the man who has a withered hand to step forward. And then he turns around and looks at the religious leaders and he says, hey, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath, listen to this, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they're silent. Of course, how are you going to answer that question? Now, what's the point? The point is this, is Jesus is saying, look it, if I do not heal this man, if I neglect to heal him, in order to even uphold some religious law, it would be an evil act. And then he says it would be equivalent to killing. Because by not healing this man, I'm allowing him to go to his grave. Now, here, here's the interesting thing. The word kill in, in the New Testament language literally means premeditated murder. Premeditated murder. So Jesus is saying, look it. Hey, if I don't heal this guy, I would be doing evil. And guess what? God can't do evil. And Jesus, as the Son of God, couldn't do evil. Because intrinsically, he was holy. He was good. You know, remember the, the, uh, the, the rich young ruler came to him? He said, good teacher. And he said, why do you call me good teacher? Only one is good, God. He's saying, you realize who you're speaking with? God in the flesh here? So the whole point is that God cannot do evil. So Jesus, of course, is grieved by the hardness of their hearts. They don't care about this guy. They don't want to see him healed. So he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And as he stretches it out, his hand is restored as whole as the other. Isn't that powerful? So God is compassionate. He's merciful. He wants to heal people. We have to recognize that as part of the character of Christ to see miracles and healing, because the purpose of them is, is to meet people's needs, yes. But we said in another session that you may know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins. I say to you, arise, take up your bed and walk. So there's an ultimate purpose. It, a sign points you to a direction or a, a place, a destination. The sign is to point us to God. The miracle, you know, is, is it meets a need and a wonder literally it, it causes us to wonder, it, it jars us, it arrests our attention. It captivates us in a way that we could not be and would not be captivated without supernatural intervention. All right, now, the second reason why we should expect to see miracles as part of the message of the kingdom is the completeness of the gospel. The completeness of the gospel. Uh, we might say the comprehensiveness of the gospel, the completeness of the gospel. Here's what I'm trying to say. One of the most common misconceptions about the gospel is that really it's only about concerned about spiritual needs. You know, the most important is spiritual. That's kind of what people say, right? You know what? Because the Bible says you can enter the kingdom of heaven, you know, with, with one eye. Yeah, but, you know, you, 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 you know so cut off your hand. And, and so, but, but Jesus was using hyperbole there. He was using the art of exaggeration to make a point. He wasn't saying to literally cut off your, your hand or, or to gouge out your eye, obviously. I mean, there are people that have done it. But the bottom line is that that's not what he was saying. It was a literary device that was being employed to, you know, to exaggerate, to make a point. And, and so he's, he's not saying here that, you know, physically God doesn't really give a rip about you, what you go through. And then, of course, we had all these people that go around saying, well, you know, this sickness is for the glory of God. But every time you read that in the Bible, any reference, you know, where he says, well, you know, what did he say? This isn't unto death. It's for the glory of God. Well, Lazarus is already dead, so how is it to the glory of God? He was raised back to life again. The, you know, the, the, the uh, blind man, the young man who was blind in uh, John chapter 9, it says it was to the glory of God. You know, when they said, who sinned, him or his parents, that he was born this way? You know, and so I don't know if they believe in reincarnation or what, but what ends up happening is he says neither, right? Neither. But that, what, God might be glorified. Now, how was God glorified? He was healed. That's how he was glorified. 
Some people will try to tell you that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a physical condition. And, and they will tell you, they will say things to you like Paul said, even with such large letters I write. Or Paul talks about, you know, in Galatians, that if I could, I'd take my eyes out and give it to you. And, and they'll try to say, well, that means Paul had bad eyes. He was saying, again, it was just um, an, an expression. It's like, I'll give you the shirt off my back. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like, if I could take my eyes out, I would do that. He wasn't saying he was blind. There's nowhere that says Paul was blind. There's nowhere in the scripture that says that his thorn in the flesh was a physical condition. There's absolutely nowhere where it states that. In fact, the Bible is very clear what the thorn in the flesh was. Have you ever wondered what it is? Do you know what it is? Well, let me tell you, it's here. You don't have to guess. It's right here. It tells us. It talks about it in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. and verse 7 it says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations... A thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. There you go. A thorn in the flesh is a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, why? Listen to this. Lest I be exalted above measure. Now, Paul says, I pled with the Lord three times. He says, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Then listen to this. You ready? Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Now, the word infirmity is what they often say, is that that means, well, an infirmity is a sickness, a spirit of infirmity. Yes, it's true that a spirit of infirmity can be, but the word literally means weaknesses as well. And so Paul's not, it can be used, if you, if you study it, it can be used not just to refer to sickness. Okay, it can be used to just speak to weaknesses in general. So Paul's saying, uh, you know, generically speaking, he's saying, in my weaknesses. I rejoice in my weaknesses. He's not saying that, and there's nothing here to say that, that God gave him sickness. Now, am I saying that Paul was never sick? I don't know. It doesn't tell us, as far as I know, in the scripture, that he was there were people that were sick, obviously. Paul says, hey, you know, I left Trophimus sick at Miletus, and there's other, these other scriptures. Yes, people get sick. Does it mean it's their lack of faith? No, not necessarily. We live in a world, and that's part of the kingdom, where, the, you know, that's why there's a better kingdom coming. Okay? So we still struggle with stuff. Guess what? Unless Jesus comes back, we're going to all die. Okay? And the Bible says it's appointed unto man to die once and then the end shall come, right? So we are going to all die, but does that mean that we just say, you know, whether it's sickness or death, Jesus healed sickness, but he raised the dead when he was on the earth too, didn't he? So, you know, obviously there's a time, there's an occasion where uh, we're not going to be raised back to life again unless Jesus comes back, but we have to get to that place where we trust God. Um, what I'll do is I'll take some questions after the session because of the videotaping, right? Um, so, so understand that. Now, <clears throat> it says, by the way, lest he be exalted above measure, one possible uh, interpretation of that is that he was getting to such a place of authority and power and effectiveness that the devil said, I'm trying to shut you down, lest you be exalted. Okay. Now, some people will argue, well, the Greek word that is used there is always used negatively meaning pride, and that's true, but there's some times when we can find words used, if you look hard enough, in the non-traditional, non-conventional way. So, you know, um, the bottom line is, it was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, and uh, whether it was God just saying, hey, Paul, I'm going to allow you to go through persecution, hardships, difficulties, because remember when Paul was called, the Lord said, go and tell him how much he'll suffer for my name's sake. Now, being persecuted by the devil, even when he uses human instrumentation, and being afflicted by God, those are two different things altogether. And how dare we say that a good God would make us sick? He would never make us sick. If we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father? How much more? So... So God is not into that business.
okay? He wants to make us whole. And, uh, and we, you know, unfortunately, I'm not saying that we're going to all die, you know, at 120, and I know people believe that, and that's great, I'm going to believe for that, but I'm just saying, you know, the bottom line is, in all of this, in all of this, we are waiting for a better kingdom. We're waiting for mortality to be swallowed up by immortality, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, the perishable to be overcome by the imperishable when we receive a new body, and the final enemy to be defeated is death. So, just a, a little bit of clarification there. All right, let's look at Matthew 8, verse 16 and 17. It's a, the story is here, Jesus is going around, he's healing the sick, and he's driving out demons. And the Bible says in Matthew 8, 16 and 17, that this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And here's what it says. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Now, Jesus was fulfilling what was previously written. This verse is actually found in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. And when you go to Isaiah 53, verse 4 there, you will see that it says, He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Now, Matthew says He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Isaiah says He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. What's going on here? Well, the, the deal is that the word here is, is literally a term that means to feel pain. It can be translated literally or figuratively. So in other words, he's saying that Isaiah took up, God is saying through Isaiah that Jesus took upon himself anything that causes us pain. Whether it's physical pain, spiritual pain, psychological pain, and I love what Bill Johnson says on page 32 of When Heaven Invades Earth. He says, the gospel of salvation is to touch the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. John G. Lake called this a triune salvation. A study on the word evil confirms that the intended reach of his redemption. That word is found in Matthew 6, 13, where God says, you know, tells us to pray, deliver us from evil. The word evil represents the entire curse of sin upon man. Poneris is the Greek word for evil. It comes from the word ponos, which means pain. And the word came from the root word penes, which means poor. Look at it. Evil, sin, pain, sickness, poor, poverty. Jesus destroyed the power of sin, sickness, and poverty through his redemptive work on the cross. In Adam and Eve's commission to subdue the earth, they were without sickness, they were without poverty, and they were without sin. Now that we are restored to his original purpose, should we expect anything less? After all, this is called the better covenant. So, again, I, I just want to clarify that we are believing God and we must believe God. And you know what? Anything that is not of faith is sin, right? So, I, I know, and I'm not trying to be, um, you know, just give a pat answer here. Because there are people that, that have been praying and fasting and believing God for healing and they die. And what do you do with that? You just tell them, hey, you know what? You just obviously didn't have faith. Um, don't do that. That's, that's not the way to go. Um, the bottom line in, in all things is we need to contend and we need to believe. And, and there are a lot of people that will tell you, well, you just need to have faith, brother, and stand in there. But they won't fast for you. They don't fast for you. But they'll just rebuke you and correct you and tell you you need to have faith. And, uh, you know, I, I really believe that there's a place spiritually, obviously, where we need to learn to fast and pray and get deep with God because there's some miracles that will never happen unless we really fast and pray. So it, it's, it's not that it's simple. There's, there's a cost. And I'm concerned about this uh, crazy, whacked out, jacked up grace message that's going around right now that basically says all you need to do is just believe it. You know, he's done it all. And, and, well, why, why did Jesus tell us to fast? Why did he tell us to pray? Why did he spend the night in prayer? I read a guy on Facebook not too long ago who's, who's uh, you know, espousing this grace message. Really, it's a pseudo-grace. I call it disgrace because grace is being dissed. Yeah. And, and uh, I, yeah, I preached a message on that not too long ago called disgrace. But... See, and, and here's what's happening is he actually made a statement on Facebook. He said, you know what? He said, some of the, the men who've written the epistles in the New Testament, he said, um, 
and he mentions Galatians. Who wrote Galatians, by the way? Paul, right? Paul wrote Galatians. And he said, really, they weren't inspired by the Holy Spirit because Paul was still living under the law. Some of the things he said in Galatians show that he was under the law. So really, Galatians isn't inspired of the Holy Spirit. It's not part of the Bible. So who, who, who I mean, so these guys are saying this right now. Now, I know that's an extreme example, but they are saying this. So you better be very careful. Okay. Grace empowers us. You know, grace empowers us to live a holy and righteous life and to uphold the righteous requirements of the law. So, but Jesus covered all of this so we can walk, not through just confessing it or just saying, well, he did it all. No, 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 we have to, we have to learn to commune with God. We'll talk more about this. The third reason why we can expect miracles is the callousness of men's hearts. The callousness of men's hearts. The Lord wants to manifest His supernatural power today because there are so many that need powerful proof that the gospel is true. Um, because you know why? The Bible says that Satan, the God of this world, has blinded them so they cannot believe. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So New Testament signs and wonders literally are the added dimension, the added component that is needed to break through and penetrate the darkness of men's hearts with the light of the gospel. So what happens is God himself, the Bible says, bears witness to the message. He, I'm sorry, Hebrews 2, verse 4, God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles. God testifies to the gospel. Isn't that powerful? The disciples went out everywhere and preached, and the Lord worked with them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs, Mark 16, 20. So God literally uses signs and wonders and miracles to penetrate the hardness of men's hearts. Now, an example, Philip was led by the Holy Spirit to go to Samaria and preach Christ to the multitudes. And I, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. But in the natural, it was, I'm sure, the last place on earth he ever wanted to be. Philip was from Jerusalem. Samaritans and Jews had no dealings with each other. There was this deep-seated racial prejudice as well as sharp theological disagreement among them. And yet, the Bible says that against all odds, Philip was able to break through and see revival. Acts chapter 8, verse 5 says, I'm sorry, verse 6 says, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. The multitudes. It's not like he just got a few people that were interested. The multitudes with one accord heeded. Somebody that they wouldn't receive in the natural. Okay. And so why was it that the people who were typically averse toward Jews would give Philip their undivided attention? Look what it says. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Again, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So that is the power of the gospel at work. The kingdom of God, not just in word, but in power. There is, by the way, a fourth um, reason why signs and wonders and miracles are needed. And it doesn't have anything to do with unbelievers. It has to do with us who are believers. And that is what I call the compounding of faith. I won't really get into this, but the compounding of faith. What that happens is every time you see God do something miraculous, what does it do to you? It increases your faith. And it says in Romans 1.17 that we're, we are to live by faith and we're to go from faith to faith. So when you see a miracle, it's supposed to prepare you. When, when David's realized that God was with him and he killed the lion, then he killed the bear, right? He knew the Detroit Lions were a problem, Chicago Bears, next thing New York Giants, right? So, so I'm just kidding. So he's going after the bear, the lions, and then what? The giant, right? He said, hey, God was with me. I, I killed this bear, killed the lion, tore him apart with my bare hands. God that was with me then is going to be with me now. So it literally compounds your faith, brings you to a place where you can trust God. And... Uh, that, that's the whole point of it. And, and that's why we need miracles, signs, and wonders. It helps the, the people of God to grow as well in their faith.